Okay, esteemed panelists, will you please introduce yourselves to us? Yes, um, so I'm Jess Bautista. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am a second year PhD student in the School of Education and I have a toddler, I have a two-year-old. So he came with me to Michigan, um, but also just like as a parent, like I don't know where y'all are or what's happening or as a caregiver. So like you do you. <laughs> and I'm really glad that y'all could all be here. Um, nice meeting you, everyone. My name is Hong Han Ho. I am a fourth year PhD candidate in the joint program in social work and psychology. Um, technically, I'm supposed to be fifth year, but I did end up taking a medical leave when I was giving birth to my child, who's now um, 18 months. Um, and he was a NICU graduate and now he's healthy. Um, but definitely, I had a lot of unexpected um, like pregnancy issues and even my child going to NICU during my PhD. And yeah, I was able to receive quite a good support from U of M and hopefully that my um, experience can also just encourage you guys as well. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm so glad to see so many people uh, at this session. My name is Ansley. Um, I'm gonna be an eighth year in the MD PhD program here at U of M. Uh, I'm wrapping up my PhD right now. Um, so yeah, near the end of that, I did not come into school with children, but I've had two babies during my PhD. Uh, I have a three-year-old, uh, and a five-month-old. So I just had my second in March. So, uh, I've done this twice now, but I'm really, uh, excited to just answer your questions and, uh, get to know you guys. And I am Sam, um, again, a ninth year candidate in the sociology department, and I am a caregiver. My partner developed a really debilitating chronic illness, um, well, disability, um, about four years ago and lost sort of care taking abilities for herself. And um, so I stepped in. And so that will be this perspective that I'll be coming from. Okay, y'all, so thank you for introducing yourselves to us. I would like you to share with us what you wish you knew in your first year. And either in your first year here or your first year as a parent or caregiver. Um, so first year here at Michigan, I mean, first year as a parent, like, oh, but uh, first year here at Michigan, one of the things that I really wish I had known, and it's in my background um, right now, is I did not realize how much of the support and subsidies that the university offers actually come, like our union fought for in Union One. I just didn't know that, right? And so I sort of took the university's line of like, we are giving you these great subsidies and the subsidies are amazing, but they didn't just give them to us, like we fought for them. Um, so like kind of knowing some of the background of where these things really came from and how to access all of them. There's a lot of like, as parents and caregivers, we're super busy and we have a lot going on. And so it's sometimes hard to find the resources you're looking for. So things like you have a freecare.com account, um, you have access to a parent caregiver study space in the undergraduate library. It's in the basement. Um, but you have access to it. it's really nice and there's like stuff kids can play and books kids can read in there um, with computers and it's like pretty big and roomy so if you can't find a study space go to the library like that room is always available to you I think you have to get a passcode but um, the there's a parent caregiver group that so you sign up for their emails and you get the passcode um, stuff like that like some of the the resources that are maybe not like so obvious, but it can be really helpful when you need them. Um, I think for me, some of the things that I really wish I knew and I'm just in the process of just doing that these days is just able to like connect with mentors who are not your advisors and it is definitely okay for you to be connected and receive support from those who kind of had a similar experience as you. So for me, uh, both of my advisors are uh, male professors and they are fathers, but definitely have a very different experience being um, like you know, childcare experiences. So 
and I was able to um, get connected with different professors who were able to give birth um, during PhD or during um, um, during their like a tenure assistant professorship and just able to connect with them was really helpful. And one of the things that that gave me a lot of anxiety when I was pregnant that later I found out that or the advice that I heard that was really helpful later. Um, definitely after our first year is that there's no great time to have child uh, and the time you make a decision to have a child is like the best time so um, just work can stop um, and if you yeah if you feel like like a right time to do it, then you know with the right support from um, right support and mentorship I think it's definitely doable and I think there are people who are actually really excited for having for PhD students having kids while they're definitely going to be some hurdles and opposition you will face both explicitly and explicitly, right? So knowing that balance is definitely uh, helpful. Uh, I, when I started my full program, so I actually started like in med school for a couple of years, um, I didn't think it would even be possible for me to have kids during this phase of life. I hadn't seen anyone do it. And so I just kind of thought I just was like well I have to wait because it's just not going to happen then and it was actually seeing so that was my very first year and it was actually near the in the middle of my second year that there were two women four or five years ahead of me in the program who were both pregnant and that was the first time I saw people be pregnant in this in this phase of our careers and in training um, and that really struck me because I, I just didn't think that was possible and so um, I wish I had known when I started the program because I knew I wanted to have children and I just didn't know when I could do it, um, that it was possible to do it. So you guys are already all ahead of me because you're already here and you haven't even started your program yet um, and seeing parents in the program and, you know, people that are still thriving, uh, I think is really important to see. So I'm glad that I got to see that. And when I came to the PhD phase of my uh, program, by then I was like, I know I can do this. Uh, God, God. I need to find support the mentors as well. Um, and that was really important to knowing that I would be supported during this phase of our life. I wish I'd known that becoming a caregiver would um, cause, would affect my progress in the in the program and would prolong my progress in the program and like not not in any um negative way but there was a lot of resistance uh in, internally on my end of like trying to keep up and also trying to manage my caregiving responsibilities and like falling short <laughs> on both sides and like feeling horrible <laughs> that was like a good six months <laughs> because I just I wasn't accepting the situation that I was in really and understanding that like there will be times like there will be months when like I am not going to be able to um, give to my, there, there, there were months when I just didn't do any work, um, especially because like my partner's disability is very um, nonlinear. And so there are months when there are a lot of flare ups and then there are months like when she's really good. And so like the months when she's not that great, like let it go. I let it go. I will finish this program when I finish this program. You know what I mean? And um, I really wish that I had accepted that earlier, it would have brought a lot more ease and a lot less stress in my life if I had um, allowed myself to be where I was rather than where I thought I should be. Okay, thanks y'all for letting us know what you wish you had known in your first year. Now, would you share with us what you wish you had done in your first year? Um. So, I did some of this, but I wish I had done a little bit more of it. It's just like finding out who other parents are, um, both in terms of faculty and students, because um, that can actually be really helpful information, as was kind of already mentioned. Um, and then sort of making like a parent group. Like I have a couple of other people that I talk to that have kids my age that they're not in my program, but they are a great source of support. And will especially like I was coming from Texas, so it's a very different place to be here. Um, so I had a friend that was telling me about uh, Patagonia does secondhand clothing for kids. That's like warm winter clothes. I think it's called worn wear, 
that was a big deal for me because it's like good quality clothes that are half the price. And I didn't want new stuff for my kid because he's going to wear it for three days. <laughs> um, so like, you know, getting to know those people and then also doing like some of the fun stuff that's free or low cost, um, which I definitely wanted to mention. Cause like, there's a lot of really, like one of the reasons we decided to come to Michigan is that it felt family friendly. There's a lot of green space. There's, um, the downtown library is free to go to and has like amazing toys in it. Like my kid loves going there. Um, we go to Barnes and Noble and just play the trains and then go home. Um, so stuff, stuff like that, uh, Domino's farms, there's another like white Lotus farm where you can just like feed the animals and just hang out outside. Um, stuff like that is, is really, really nice. And it's like, some of it is you need a car for, but some of it is, is close by. Um, just trying to do more of that stuff. I think also like kind of to what Sam was talking about, I cannot relate to having a mid program life change. So like, I completely understand, like hear where you're coming from. For me coming in with a kid, I was like, I can't work all the time. <laughs> I can't do it. So in some ways it was kind of a blessing because I'm sure like many of you, like PhD type A perfectionist, like tries too much. Um, so it helps me to like tone down that side of myself and try to relax because when you're caregiving, like that's all you're doing. <laughs> Um, one thing that I wish I could have done better at the same time, I am still thankful for where I'm at is just being a little more strategic about how to have a child, when to have a child, and how to afford a child. Um, I guess what I'm saying is like, um, there's definitely time that's really busy and there's definitely time they're not busy. Um, so, you know, like I got advice, like best time to have a child is right after dissertation um which that's what I was planning but then I had a pregnancy issue so then I actually had to have a child before dissertation and not dissertation sorry prelim 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 and exam uh, prelim so um so I feel like there's definitely things that I was trying my best to prepare to leave and have this time away at the same time I did not know that pregnancy can just complicate it very quickly at least for me and just knowing that is a possibility and knowing that not every pregnancy is going to be smooth uh, was something that I wish I knew better so um although you know I was able to kind of advance on time like after I took a semester up it was definitely a stress to have a newborn child and trying to take my prelim because that timeline didn't work out so uh, I think if I could have gone back maybe I would have given myself a little more buffer Instead of thinking that everything will happen according to my plan. Um, I'll kind of frame this as like what I wish I did the first year when I did have a child. Um, so I echo what um, has kind of been said before of like finding these resources and knowing that they're out there and finding these other parents or parent groups. Um, it was sometime, I think, really, really when like COVID started that, and that's the when I had like my, my first child was in 2020. Um, so that was like already a very isolating experience. So then trying to find a community was a little harder at that time, but um, there were, I think, I feel like a lot of student groups kind of really popped up at that time to reach out and try to create community and response. And so um, I did eventually find some more of these like student parent groups and, um, I was able to connect with some more people kind of going through the same phase of life. So I encourage you to, you know, reach out to those groups before, get on listservs, email listservs, even if you don't have children yet or you're planning to at some point, I think it's helpful to already be tuned into those resources. And that's something I wish I knew before I even got pregnant because even during pregnancy, um, there's still resources available to us and things that I'd want to know in the community about. I wish I what I wish I'd done when the first year I became a caregiver was to communicate my situation um, to my um, advisor, to my chair, to my grad director. I didn't. I thought that 
I could <laughs> do this alone. <laughs> um, and that was, um, I eventually needed to communicate because, you know, I was I was no longer hitting the marks. And um, when I had said I was going to hit marks and then it was like, Sam, you've been, you've like your like life circumstances changed like nine months ago to almost a year ago. And like, you're just now letting us know they were not upset in any way. They were incredibly understanding, incredibly patient and incredibly um, just like open. And I wish I had also known that, that it would have been okay to communicate immediately. Like, this is what I'm going through. So then we could have made a plan. Um, and so I wouldn't have had to have been like, you, those six to nine months of just like freaking out and being myself up and like just struggling alone. Um, yeah. So I just communication up front immediately, like my circumstances have changed. I don't know. For, I don't know for how long I did not think it was going to be this long, but <laughs> you never do. Right. Um, but yeah, communication. Uh, I find that the people at Michigan, at least in my department are incredibly understanding. Um, and I'm really grateful for that, but it's also not something that I, assumed they would be and I guess that's on me okay y'all so now that you've shared with us what you wish you had done in your first year can you please share with us the best things that helped you when you first either got here or first became a parent here so actually what I was going to share is really related to Sam what you were saying and again I came in as a parent right like did not have that circumstance uh change when I got here but communicating what I was going to be able to do and when I was going to be able to do it and for how long and when I wasn't going to be able to and that like was super helpful for me so like I don't do anything from 4 30 to 8 I just don't that's family time it's blocked off on my calendar um if something comes up that I really want to do then I'll talk to my partner about it and we'll see if I can go right which usually like he's an amazing partner dad whatever. Um, he's not the issue. <laughs> so, but like really having that conversation and like, I will hedge this with, I have a super supportive advisor and most of the people in the school of education are pretty kid oriented. Um, I know that's not always true. Right. Um, but I will also say I asked for things that I later found out other people had like wanted to also ask for. And so I would strongly encourage you to ask for the things that you need. Um, for example, I had a week long orientation when I came like last year and I had childcare and then I didn't have childcare anymore. And my partner was working in Detroit. And so I was like, uh, one, I really want to go because I want to network. I don't feel like I should be excluded because all these other people are getting to go and meet each other and like build this community. And that is what is, can be so hard to build when you're a parent or caregiver. So it's like, this is, that's not okay for me. Um, so I just asked them, Hey, I have a 15 month old. Can he come with me? And he came every single day. They were super supportive. Again, I know that's not going to be true everywhere, but what were my other, my other options were just not going right. And it ended up being like people now, will see me and be like, oh, you're the one that brought your kid every day. And I'm like, oh, hey, that's fantastic. Like from my perspective, I think that's great. Making kids more visible and accepted members of our society is definitely something that I am on board for. Um, but we live in this like grind work culture and that's no different here, right? And so sometimes we have to advocate for it. So if you're feeling brave enough to do that, know that at least one person here is supporting you. Um, I think my thoughts are kind of on a, on a similar line with Jess. I think in some sense, like normalizing having a child and, you know, like you have the power and autonomy to make decisions on what that would look like for you um, at the same time. Like I really saw always like, you know, one of the... Uh, a practical way of exercising women's rights for me or just like advocating for women in higher education was actually normalizing child caring experience and so like even similar way like instead of asking people like I'm gonna bring a child especially like I mean not like maybe some I mean some meetings I didn't but like 
but there's definitely meetings I feel like it's actually okay for me to bring like I would just you know be like you know ask like oh can I bring a child or like oh hey I'm gonna I would have to bring the child and just kind of like give them that um notice and I I always saw that working and sometimes people feel uncomfortable like the first time but then they are realizing oh this is like part of life and this is part of like what we really need like if we're really striving for DEI as the university says like these are some of the diversity in the DEI efforts as well um that's like one thing um another thing is and I think this is also something that everyone have to make decision on how comfortable they are but you know, for some people, they say, oh, don't ever talk about wanting to have a kid or having a kid. And then some people are like, no, it's okay to talk about it. And I think for me, I was just always very explicit about planning to have a child during my PhD, which definitely kind of like polarized, like my, even my mentors in some sense, like I would not get close to certain people because I knew, or they had a very like a loop view because they think I'm not going to be good enough or hardworking enough or then where I will be able to get really strongly connected to other people who really care about like success of um, individuals or child uh, or, or caregivers. So um, in some sense, like, I guess like signaling myself as who I am or what I want to do. Yes, sometimes kind of could bring like opposition, but I actually saw much more benefits of doing that. So those are some of the things that, yeah, I echo what Jess said. I would say that um, the things that really helped me feel successful, especially like during pregnancy in my first year with the child were my support system internally, having a, a lab group that was really uh, supportive of me having a child and uh, my mentor who was incredibly supportive. And honestly, they're a big reason why my husband and I thought we would be comfortable doing it again um, during this phase I you know I was like you know we did it well I feel like this is the right environment I didn't want to have to do it when I go back to med school or when I'm in residency because I know what you know especially the first year or two of a you know infancy and everything just very demanding and I was like I don't want to do that much less be pregnant uh during some of these other maybe more consuming parts of my training um so having that was really important and so to do that when I was actually rotating with my research labs um, and having discussions with mentors you know, and like whether or not I was gonna join their group, I told them I'm planning to get married and I'm planning to have a child during this phase of my career. And is that something you would support or that you, um, you know, like how, how did you, everyone I worked with had children themselves. So I was like, how did you handle this life decision? And, you know, they're, people that I interviewed or rotated with who didn't seem as supportive of me doing that in this phase of my career. And that's part of the reason I didn't choose their labs. Um, so I just, again, similar to what's kind of been said, I was very upfront about what my personal goals were um, and that this was gonna be something that happened whether they were on board or not. <laughs> and, uh, but I really hope that they would be uh, on board and supportive and thankfully uh, you know the group that I did choose has been incredibly supportive beyond I could like anything I could imagine but it was really important that I vocalize that to begin with and uh, similar to what's been shared about you know issues when childcare has been a problem uh, my kids have both come to lab with me like some days I'm like they just gotta go they gotta come they come to meetings uh, they're in Zoom meetings with me. It's just, that's just the reality. I, I echo what Jess said about, you know, I wish children were a lot more visible in society in general. That's something I'm very passionate about as well. And so that's part of, that's part of this is that, you know, some days kids just got to go to work and they, they come and they know what to do. And, um, or I just have to adjust what I can do in a day and learning that flexibility mid program was really difficult. Sorry, I feel like I'm getting a little I'm just like going off, but of uh, learning, you know, uh, having to adjust to being much more flexible mid program was difficult, but I think in the end, it has actually made me a much better student um, because I know how to plan my time a lot better than when I just had infinite amounts of time. I don't have that. So I have to be much more strategic. Um, it makes me a better communicator to ask what I, for what I need and what, you know, what type of support and accommodations I might need. Um, and to, you know, just be patient because um, a lot of your PhD tests your patients and ch children do that too. So uh, I definitely taken a, learned a lot more, I think, by becoming a parent during the program than if I had not. 
I don't know if I have anything that I can add. I feel like um, everything um, that has been said about what has helped everyone else is really also just what's helped me. Um, the blocking off of time of like, this is when I do not work. Like there is no other, like that's, it's not, it's not negotiable. It's not happening. Like this is for, um, and also I think just understanding that like, I am no longer a grad student first and um, I probably shouldn't have ever been a grad student first, let's be real. <laughs> um, but uh, that is definitely no longer like my um, primary identity and um, sort of communicating that with everyone. For instance, like when I got this job, like I told um, my my supervisor, like there will be we have random doctor's visits throughout the week. Do you know what I mean? Like there are, are random hospital visits. There are times when I just will not be able to show um, flexibility and communicating the need for that flexibility or um, rather that like how do I put this? That this is not, the, was that flexibility is sort of a non-negotiable and not sort of like asking for it, but like that this is like, if, as um, Sung Hyun said, like if DEI is like what Michigan's all about, like if this is uh, the supportive environment that you say that it is like, then this is who, who I am and what I come with. And, um, and so like when you hire me, this is what you're also getting. Um, and it has worked out great. It has, um, and sort of in communicating that sort of with everyone that I sort of um, have to interact with in this um, academic space has been, has worked out really well. And it's been, they're super helpful. They're really understanding and um, checking in about like, are you sure you, are you sure you have the time for this? Da, 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 da. Um, and uh, so communicating uh, my needs and also that my needs are not negotiable, I think has been really, has helped me and also just like blocking off time as well. And, and echoing what everyone else has said, like, granted, I didn't, I had my advisor before um, I became a caregiver, but, um, and I am so grateful for the advisor that I had. Finding someone who supports your, um, who you are as a human being and how you show up is so, I believe, so much more important than like, if they match with your research, like, <laughs> you need someone to guide you through these next, if you're in a PhD, like, maybe 10 years, <laughs> and um, you can find academic and intellectual and like research mentors without necessarily them being the one who sort of like calls the shots in your um in your academic life like I think having someone who calls the shots in your academic life needs to be someone who understands that your academic life is not your entire life okay um so thank you uh thank you everyone we will now transition to our q and a and before we do that, I want to say that our my colleague was going to place our evaluation survey in the chat. Can you please do me a favor and just open the link now? And this is so you'll have it in a tab ready and waiting for you when we're done. And I want to remind y'all that we will be moving through this Q&A by keeping stack. And for those of us who weren't with us when I first explained stack, it's just going down the line of those who flag that they have a question in order of appearance. And so there's three ways to get on the stack, either raise your hand um, with the raise your hand function and I'll call on you or write stack in the chat and I'll call on you or type your question in the chat and I'll ask it for you. Um, please speak slowly so that the closed captioning can capture all that you have to say. And also for those who weren't with us at the beginning, if you haven't changed your name to the name that you registered with, please do so that we can know that you're here. And I want to remind us that we may not get to every question, but we'll provide the panelists' email addresses at the end of the Q&A um, so that you can reach out to them. Okay, so I know that we have a few questions. Let me pull them up. Someone asks, what monetary support is available for GSIs? Daycare, prolonging the PhD because of birth. Um, also, if both parents are PhDs, do we get... Do, we, do they both get benefits or is it only for one of them? Does anybody know this? Can I speak to some of it? I can't speak to all of it because I did not have a child here. Um, and I'm, I'm a student, right? I don't work for the university. And so all of this is said with the asterisk of look it up. Um, <laughs> but there is a child care subsidy. And if you Google UMICH child care subsidy, you can find it pretty easily. Um, I believe that doesn't really have to do with, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to do with your status as a, I mean, you have to be a student, but like, 
It asks you for who your child care provider is, their license number, and how much you spend um, either per month or per year or something. Uh, I would highly recommend you do that ASAP, um, like yesterday, because the funds do run out, um, but it is substantial. I, I want to say last year I got somewhere around 3000 a semester. I did not get it in the summer because I don't take of a screwed up thing that I think would be nice if it changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you have to be registered full time is my understanding. There's a couple other caveats. Um, there was another part of that. Oh, daycare. This is something I really wanted to mention to y'all, especially if you're moving from another place. You need to be on all the waiting lists for all the places, whether they're convenient or affordable. Just put your name on all of them because you don't have to pay here to put your name on the list and there's no availability. So I am I, I put my name on the list uh, March before I was even like, the day I got my acceptance, maybe even before, I was already on lists and I just kept adding. I've been taken off, like I've gotten spots at, I want to say two out of maybe 25 places. Um, and I ended up being like, you know what, the, the place I currently have is better than going that far, but like, I'm still on all the other places and you never know. Cause maybe when they're three or four, you still need it. And school doesn't start until five here. So like, just be on all the places. <laughs> it doesn't cost you anything. It just takes a, a day of your time. Um, I don't know about the, the birth stuff. Um, yes, I can answer uh, some of that as well. So there are, um, I guess, sorry, as far as um, accommodations for birthing parents. So there's actually, um, Rackham has a parental leave policy for anyone welcoming a child into their family, either through birth or adoption. Um, and this is for both the birthing parent as well as uh, a non-birthing parent. Um, it's six weeks for a non-birthing parent and eight, up to eight weeks for a birthing parent. Um, it's just like a form on Rackham's website that you fill out and you have to supply like a doctor's note of either, you know, if like for, if you're, someone if you or your partner is pregnant um, and that's how you're expecting or from like an adoption agency I think if that's the plan that you are if that's the route that you're going with like an estimated time of the child's arrival and like therefore what are eight weeks past that that you would be excused um, and then it just has to be signed by like your mentor and I think like your department's chair or something your program chair um, and then there should be no issues with that and you do you can um, extend your program by a year per child um, as part of that policy it's all part of it's all within that um, i think those were like the main question parts of that uh, daycare so um, if anyone is coming into a medical school program um, through like pibs or um, one of the like biomedical fields um, because you're associated with michigan medicine there's also, so sorry, there are three U of M childcare centers here. Um, one up in like the Northwood community, there's the Towsley Center, which is on central campus. And then there's the U of M health system childcare center. And that one is exclusively for people, including students who are affiliated with Michigan Medicine. And so um, similar to Jess, when I found out I was pregnant with my first child, I got on the waiting list for that one. And she did not get a spot until she turned one year old. So it was almost like 18 months that um, we were waiting. Um, we use like private and home care for most of her first year. And I actually only worked like three days a week during that first year um, because I, like childcare is expensive and it's very limited here as was mentioned. Um, but there are, there's subsidies for there's a child care subsidy that just mentioned, but then if you are in with a, one of the U of M centers, they have additional um, support, monetary support or subsidies for their centers specifically. And then the last thing I'll mention first uh, regarding um, some monetary support is again, if you're applying for um, any of the F grants through the NIH, again, for like these biomedical programs, um, if you're awarded either an F30 or an F31, there is a child care supplement that you can request from the NIH. It's a $2,500 a year. So it's not nothing. And it's just, uh, it gets dispensed to you in the increment each month. 
that is it's only earmarked for child care, which they don't like ask for proof of that. But I mean, it's only twenty five hundred dollars a year. You're going to use it towards child care. So um, but just making sure you have like you keep track of records and stuff. And I don't know about the question if both parents are PhD since my partner is not in and the, it does not work here. Does that go here? Um, from my understanding of the P both PhD, I think for financial support, it probably is per household, but for like leave and things like that, I think you could like stack it. Okay, thanks y'all. Also, I want to add that we will be having a panel about resources for parents and caregivers in about the third week of September, the week of September 18th. We will be holding a panel and that will have more information about things like finances and child care and um, finances <laughs> and, and grants and stuff like that. Um, so there's more to come. So someone asks, what are the different groups? Maybe parent groups they're referring to? Oops. I think um, it's one of the big ones that kind of stretches all of campus. I think it's meant for anyone at U of M um, is MCASP, uh, Michigan Caregiver and Student Parent group um they're the ones that organize or have organized the like study room that just mentioned and um they're just a really good way that they've like consolidated a lot of this this information um like on their website and everything it's a nice kind of just central repository um as far as i don't think this applies to probably many more people in this group but uh the med school does have their own like parents and medical school group, um, which has been helpful, which it's still just like another central repository for resources, regardless if you know, you're a med school or you're in grad school, but um, that's kind of the other big group that I'm, I'm familiar with. Yeah, I, I don't really know a ton of groups. I know people that I met who oh, you have a two-year-old, like anytime anybody says anything about kids, I'm like immediately, tell me more. What else? How old are they? What's their name? When do you want to do a play date at the library? Just because like knowing that somebody else is going through or has gone through something similar to you is super helpful. And some of them have turned out to be great friends of mine. Like some I just wave and check in with, right? But some I will plan, oh, when's yours going to bed mine's going to bed now okay well let's go meet up and do work after bedtime like and that is that's a, a big deal in grad school because a lot of the people you're in classes with are working in hours where you are sleeping my friend <laughs> so like finding those people that will be your study buddies a lot of times that's my my parent friends Someone asked if they'll be assigned an academic advisor and how can they get in touch with them and what kind of support can they expect from them through their MS thesis program? I think um, I that think... is program specific. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, there, Yeah, I think it's program specific. I don't think university has like a, one rule that every advisor has to follow. So I think it will be also very case by case in this support that you want. Um, I would definitely talk to like you like different people in the program to see like this type of advisor there. One thing I am realizing though, just because the one person doesn't get along with one advisor doesn't mean they're not gonna get along with other person. At the same time, if they're consistently someone who's having an issue with everyone, then that is kind of a red flag. And identifying that, that it can definitely be a smart move to make. Um, I think for the financial help for graduates who are not PhD, I do know there's some support for master's uh, level students. Um, um, but I'm not I'm not really sure fully like to what extent. 
I know that at least so for the sociology department, we are assigned an advisor when we first get in and you are able to switch that sort of at the end of your first year after if you see like do you mesh well um granted like it's a process it's not just like oh I want to switch like you have to like fill out a form and um go through a process and it's not and you have to like treat it with kid gloves it's not just like it's still like you're still sort of like I don't want to work with you anymore and like and that's and that's something that you have to treat with care um but it's also people understand because like, again, you're assigned this advisor, you're um, based off of your research interest and you, this is not somebody you've chosen. So it is commonplace to change um, your advisors. So if you are assigned somebody, you can change is what I would say. But if you were assigned, I feel like they would have told you by now. So, um, or at least they should have. So if you haven't heard, then you probably haven't been assigned. So, is there any other financial help that you guys can suggest towards um, for graduate students? They're not, this person's not a PhD yet. Um, again, like we'll have resource week um, or resource, resource panel during our resource week um, in the third week of September, where we'll talk more about like financial help specifically for parents and uh, caregivers, if y'all don't have anything. Um, I can add a couple of things for people to just like think about. Uh, one is, Rackham does have an emergency fund scholarship, which like it's not specific for parents. Um, and I think you may need to be associated with Rackham, but I'm not sure. Um, and it could cover things like emergency dental care, or if your kid goes to the ER and needs a bunch of stitches, like it could be used for that too. And I think you get to apply for that twice while you're in your program. And it's like a max of maybe 2000 or 2500 each time. Um, so that I like I know people that have used that for family situations, you know, emergency at home, have to fly home and take care of dad, whatever. Um, so that is something that is short term, but is available. Um, I also the child care subsidy, I don't think is limited to PhD students. I'm pretty sure that's open to anyone with child care needs. Um, and then like ask the ask your program managers in your departments because Michigan is flush with cash. They have the money, but you have to like find it. Um, it's there, right? It's just like knowing who the right person to ask is and what the right questions to ask are. And we're all in different departments and are all of our people are different. There are also- Yeah, you have- um, Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Do you no, have no, else? don't, because she's okay. asking the questions in order and I just jumped in to respond to one that I saw and I- <laughs> Okay. Um, I Rackham also has some uh, funds to help if you want to travel for conferences. Um, so they have a travel grant with children. So there's a travel grant that you can just get as any student that helps pay towards conference travel. Um, but then there's also parents with children can get this special grant um, that you can use to cover for extra child care while you're away. Um, it also can be to bring your child with you. Um, so I actually went to Paris for a conference with my in November and I brought my husband who, you know, he was on his own dime. Um, but we brought him and then my child um, got to go. She learned what the Eiffel Tower was very quickly, which was cool. Um, and so that helped pay like towards her flight to come. So it was, easy, you know, it was a nice way to kind of make a little trip out of something. But um, it also can provide care if you bring your child somewhere with you, et cetera. So there are, like Jess mentioned, there is money. It's just like kind of hidden, but if you know where to look, you or just keep digging, just keep looking for stuff and you you can find additional resources for, for parents. Um, I do actually want to also answer this question before like the time ends. So there was a question about the leave and reduce hours and complication negotiation. Um, one thing to keep in mind is I think every department is different. Um, and even though there is like an overall general policy that the way school may handle is different as well. Um, and I think there's like multiple levels where you can do the negotiation where one can be like a soft negotiation that you do with your advisor through communication. Um, some stuff may involve a departmental level. So even for me, like when I realized I had to take a medical leave, Actually, my department didn't want me to take the full leave. 
And it wasn't from like an ill will, but more so they really wanted to make sure because if I'm taking a medical leave that I have the health insurance, because the caveat is if you're taking a leave, you don't have the insurance anymore in some cases. Um, so he wanted, my, our director wanted me to stay in the programs because he, for him, he was like, what? like, it doesn't make sense that the leave, you're leaving because you have a medical issue, but then, then you won't have insurance to cover that. Um, but I was at a place where I was like, I just need to take a leave. So we'll figure out something out. Obviously I was not in my mind. So then what he did is actually, he was able to get an emergency fund from our department to only cover my insurance so I can take the leave. But again, I think that's not, a, I don't know if it's a common practice. I think it was a practice that my director did to go above and beyond to support the students. So I do think, unfortunately, even the Reckon has done a lot of stuff to like provide safe net for students. A lot of them is dependent on the relationship with the, the, what the directors do, the universe, like the school level do, department level do, or your director, like how involved they are, or like whether your advisor is gonna fly for you or not. And I think this is where like, it kind of goes back to like, you know, obviously you don't, you don't like, you know, you're not building relationships just so you can take advantage out of them or get favor out of them. But I think having a good relationship rapport and communication with the people around you is really important. And actually like staff members, even though they might not have the glorious fancy titles, they're the ones who knows the most about all the different ways to provide the support. And like, even for me, like I had a one time, like my laptop broke down and I didn't have money to like pay right away. And I needed, I needed to right away for my analysis, you know, and then my, this one of the staff members somehow able to find this random scholarship that no one really applies for. So then my, uh, I can get a new laptop and stuff like that. So. I think these are some of the things to keep in mind is that there's a university rule and there's like a soft cultural norm expectation rule that's set by department and your advisors. And I think part of the being a um, PhD student is navigating both the institutional um, rules and then these network social support um, expectations, if that makes sense. So Sung Yoon is um, answering the question, can you talk through the experience of taking leave slash reduced hours and any complications or negotiations that you had to do around that? What were your funding situations? How did you maintain health care coverage? To follow up with that, so the sociology department, I'm not sure if every department has this, but um, they have something called Canto, which is basically like it covers your tuition and your grad care. Um, but uh, there's no stipend involved. So you can sort of stay enrolled um, and sort of a continual enrollment, even though you're sort of like not <laughs> here. And it allows you to maintain your, um, your uh, health insurance. And also to highlight Sun Yoon's point, like the only reason I found that out was because um, our administrative staff were, were looking for ways to keep me here <laughs> when I was um, trying to figure out how to be able to stay but not necessarily participate <laughs> in my um, academic process at the time. And so definitely getting to know um, your, um, getting to know and love and appreciate your, um, the staff members in your department. I mean, they're the only reasons you'll get graduate. I, I promise you, like they, they are there to, um, the support that they provide for, the students is, I feel like, really unmatched. Yeah. Sam, do you mind if I answer this question about healthcare costs? Okay. Um, so I'll I'll read it since you just read it. Uh, I figure that's also for the captioning. Somebody asked, uh, "Can you talk about healthcare costs? I have coverage through my program. What about a potential child?" And like, honestly, Michigan has one of the better healthcare pro. Again fought for and won by the union, not a gift from our benevolent overlords, okay? But it is one of the best in the country. Um, it might be the best, honestly. Uh, I have a partner who's a type one diabetic. So we have outstanding, med like huge medical bills every month. Um, my son had uh, stitches when, when we first moved here, like semester one, he like hits the bookshelf and goes to the ER. Um, and we've also, like I'm from Houston, big city, terrible health insurance programs, right? Um, it's it's really nice. I think we paid like a hundred bucks for his ER visit for like the whole thing. 
and that was it. And I was expecting like 300 and then another bill and then maybe a follow-up bill. Um, so generally speaking, like uh, they're also all on my coverage. So I'm covered with grad care. My partner, um, who's a domestic spouse, like we're not married, he's on my plan as, and so is my son and I don't pay for them. We pay a little bit for dental, but I am not paying, uh, what is it called when it's not a, we pay premiums, premium. but we don't pay. Thank you don't you. have any yeah. premium. It's zero dollar premium. And yeah, you can add up to, I have both of my, both of my girls and my husband are on my plan as well. And we don't pay anything. Um, uh, obviously, yes, we have co-pays like, but all, you know, it's amazing coverage. I had both of my children on this plan and all we paid for uh, were my husband's meals in the hospital because I got my meals covered and he did not. And we ended up just getting Jimmy John's anyways because, you know, hospital food. So um, as far as cost, so another, that was another reason that we decided to have a child or second child here was because we knew that it was completely free uh, to have one and now. Um, and so, yeah, the grad care, uh, is probably the best health insurance any of us will ever have in our entire life. As long as we live in America. Yeah. And I just want to yeah. counter also like give a counter example. So I had my son in Houston while I was fully employed and had health insurance and we easily paid $15,000 right through pregnancy, through labor and delivery. And I had a totally uncomplicated pregnancy and delivery. So yeah, I, if only I had known. <laughs> Just to also um, big up the uh, insurance that we have. I have, my partner is also on my insurance and we're not married and I have not lived in Ann Arbor or missed the state of Michigan in since like 2017. Um, and uh, I have insurance fully covered. Um, I can see anybody within like a 100 mile radius of like whatever address that I give, um, which I think is really incredible. And so can my partner and anywhere that we go, like we'll have um, insurance covered and that's just incredible. Yeah. Um, okay. I, we can either do one more question or we can leave with the biggest piece of advice. Panelist, which, which would you rather? Let's do one more question. Okay, so that's what I thought. Audience. Um, is there something that y'all see in the chat that you really want to speak to? The question that just came in about uh, coursework and research, mm -hmm. I think is probably what my advice would be related to anyway. Okay, please. So someone asked, have you found a major difference with having children between the coursework and the research phases of your program? I would definitely say for me, having a child right now as a candidate is easier because of flexibility. Um, because the first few years, but I have a friend who did have her first child the first year or like a second the early second year so it is feasible but I did find like coursework you have to be on campus all the time you have to worry about finishing your prelims and things like that whereas once you kind of there's just like a good time like you, right before you're like defending your perspectives and then you're done with your all the coursework and kind of just pass your uh prelim that's like kind of a good time where people let you kind of take some free time to explore really kind of figure out what you want to do with dissertation so uh, I definitely see the differences and I think it's definitely case by case, but general advice I have received is try to wait until at least you're done with your prelim and your coursework um, so then you can have that flexibility. I echo that. Um, I purposely did not want to have a child while I was in med school, which is very coursework heavy. Um, and even my first year of grad school, I still had some courses, but I did um, get pregnant during my first year of grad school when I had courses. So that way, basically I did my prelim and then about like five months later is when I had my daughter. So, um, because yeah, like that was kind of a nice sweet spot where like the prelim and kind of that heavy front load of, of grad school was done. I had some time to hang out 
um, more flexibility to see really where the project was going too. And like, what was I going to, was my project going to not work out anyways? And I was going to have to take more time or no, or, you know, how did I, how was I able to kind of balance that? Um, and then I actually um, have extended my PhD by one year when I, we decided that we wanted to have a second child. Um, so I was ready to defend and finish up med school at the beginning of this calendar year. Um, and I would have gone back, but last summer when we decided that we wanted to have another child, we, I, I mean, I came to my advisor, I wasn't even pregnant. And I said, you know, this is kind of our plan. Um, I still have funding that will stay with me. So would you be willing to keep me on for another year? It kind of got, gave me some cushion to not have to rush out to finish my dissertation um, and like defend. I got to wrap up a project really nicely that I probably would have rushed at the end. And actually now I kind of have some more time to like finish some other things. So um, I'm only extending it by one year. And I feel like in addition to being able to have a second child, which is a huge, you know, accomplishment that I wanted. Um, academically, it's actually, I think, paying off very well as far as like more papers and things that I needed that I wanted to get out of this phase of my training. Um, and that was all just because I made sure we had honest communication and um, really supportive mentor. But also, if you come in with a kid, it's fine. <laughs> um, I So I'm still pre-candidacy. And so I'm still in coursework phase. Um, but this summer, I haven't taken any courses and I've just been doing research work and it's super chill, which is really nice. Like the flexibility is amazing. Um, however, I will also say that I also always finish my papers before anyone else because I didn't wait until midnight the day before it was due because I knew I wouldn't have time then. So like it, like having the kid helped me think about like I had to consciously think about my work-life balance and when I was going to plan and what I was going to do so I I'm grateful that I came in with him because I might not have taken any breaks and now I take breaks all the time okay thanks y'all thank you so much that is all the time we have for today I want to thank everyone in the audience for their presence and their participation and I want to thank our panelists for giving both your time and your expertise to us today